Amen. Thank you, Jeff and Katie. Uh, I join with the, with the cheer that says happy birthday to Jeff Snyder. I can't imagine life without Jeff. Where are you? I'm looking for Jeff. All right, there you go. There you go. I often tell people um, Jeff, Jeff leads so many things so that I can be the pretty face on stage. So uh, we don't know what we would do without you, Jeff. So, so we love you. Um, we have an awesome uh, text of God's word before us this morning. And so we're going to do what we always do. We're going to read. We're going to go after it. We're going to ask him to change us. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you meet me in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, and if you're able, um, would you just stand with me? I'd love to read this text over us. We've been in this for almost a month now, this paragraph. Uh, I think this is, this is uh, our third week in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Let me read it to us, and then we'll ask God to do what only he can do. Okay, Ephesians 5, verse 18. Here we go. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, we, uh, we come to you now. And I ask, uh, Holy Spirit, would you do that miraculous, beautiful thing that only you can do? Would you, would you illuminate your word so that you speak to us through your word in such a way that our lives um, are changed and altered so that our eyes can see and our, our ears can hear? Would you, um, would you meet us? Would you speak to us? Would you let me fade? Would you let your glory shine out? And um, God, I just pray that we'd hear your heart today. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we have spent three weeks now in this command that I have said is like the burning center of Ephesians, okay? It's as if you have this command, be filled with the Spirit, and the truths of Ephesians, and the commands of Ephesians, and everywhere we're going in Ephesians kind of, kind of orbits around this command. So, for example, after this, we're going to do like three or four weeks on marriage. And then we're going to talk about parenting. Um, and then we're going to talk about like the workplace, like to be a boss, an employer, an employee. Uh, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Uh, but like I said last week, like all of this hinges on, we don't want you just like to have a good marriage. We want you to have a spirit-filled marriage. We want you to be a husband that is filled with the Spirit of God and displaying Jesus Christ to your wife. We want you to learn like what it means to be a mom that doesn't operate on her own power and strength and effort, but is filled with the Spirit of God and therefore displaying the fruit of Jesus to her kids. Uh, we we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, but, but like, let it be known and said, like, you, try to, you try to do spiritual warfare on your own strength, you are in trouble. Okay, we need to be spirit filled. What does it mean to be filled with the spirit? And this is kind of um, this is part three. If you missed last week, like you absolutely have to go back and listen to last week because we sort of unpacked almost every single word in that text. Like, like, like you got to like this is like part two of the message last week. But we said be filled with the spirit, and we said like there's some different analogies to that. Okay. Um, different analogies filled with the spirit. The word, uh, the word spirit in Hebrew is the word ruach, which is an onomatopoeia word, which means wind, okay? And so we said, hey, picture a sailboat. Uh, some people live the Christian life, like we're on a boat that's sort of like drifting like a raft in the water, like where do we go? What do we do? Some people think it's like a rowboat, like rowing in your own power, your own effort, your own strength. But picture like a sailboat when the mast is filled with wind and then it is propelled and empowered and directed and guided by a source outside itself to do something that it could never do on itself. To be filled with the Spirit. Or we said, 
Like, here's the best analogy of all. It's not David Newman's analogy. Ready? It's Paul's. It's the biblical analogy. He said, picture alcohol. All right? And he said, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Meaning, here's a big review of last week. Ready? When you are filled with wine or drunk on wine, you yield yourself to this outside influencing agent that changes things, right? You put the right amount of alcohol in you and suddenly you will respond different and walk different and sing different and have a different attitude, a different demeanor because your life is yielded to alcohol which causes you to be different. And Paul's like, hey, don't do that, but like that, like, like just like that, you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, who is this influencing agent within you, a power source that will cause you to think and respond and act and move and, and be different because His Spirit is in you and He wants to empower you. Okay? Be filled with the Spirit. And remember what I said last week? Last week I said, hey, I would love for you to run to God's Word Anchor yourself in God's word. If you're trying to figure out where the Holy Spirit how he moves, how he is, run to God's word and let everything not be on like, like, like everything, like go to God's word. And so actually this week, um, man, I got so sick. Has anybody else been sick this week? I don't know what is like floating around the epidemics around Lebanon, but I got whatever that was. And so um, I... Uh, I had to spend a day in bed, and I was like, I don't want to waste my sickness, okay? God, what do you have for me? And I felt like the Lord was like, why don't you just read the book of Acts, which I did. Read the book of Acts, and I went through the book of Acts with a lens of saying, I want to write down everything that the Holy Spirit does, and very specifically, through the lens of every time it says that the Holy Spirit fills or being full of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so look at me. Many of you get sick this next week or these next couple weeks? Why don't you do that too? It's awesome. It like totally refreshed my heart. Okay, I just read all of the book of Acts. Like, what does it mean to be full of the Spirit? And can I just summarize a couple things that I saw? This was like very renewing to me, okay? I saw two main buckets. Every time, every time that someone was filled with the Spirit, full of the Spirit, interacting with the Spirit, it seemed like it could be in these two buckets to know Him and to make Him known. Okay, so to know Him, meaning I was just so inspired by this. The Holy Spirit was not like this doctrine to be understood, but this person of the Godhood to walk with. All right? They knew him. They, they interacted with the Holy Spirit. They were listening to him. They were speaking to him. He was speaking to them. Like you see all these, all these phrases, like, like they were full of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, don't go into that country. Or go here. Or speak this. Or I'm convicting you. Don't, you've, you've done something outside the heart of God. And it just seems like they, they listened to him and responded to him and had this dynamic personal relationship where they knew the Holy Spirit of God, and it just inspired me. Okay, Holy Spirit, I don't want to just, like, understand this academic, like, theological premise. I want to know you and walk with you like these men and women did. Okay, to know him and to make him known. Every time, I tell you, do this. Every time you study the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts, you see things like they were full of the Spirit, and they boldly proclaimed the gospel, all right? They went into crazy situations where nobody should speak, and they're like boldly proclaiming him, all right? They demonstrated the gospel. Sometimes they were filled with the Spirit, and God worked in and through them to do things that normal human beings can't do. They had to be vessels filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and they worked these miracles and these, these amazing wonders, and it was like, oh, that's God through you. The Holy Spirit displayed fruit through them. So you have all these texts like uh, Acts, um, a couple examples, Acts 11. It said, Barnabas was filled with faith and filled with the Holy Spirit. So the fruit of faith was working through his life. Um, Acts 13, it said, the disciples were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? 
This fullness of the Spirit produced the fruit of Jesus through them, to know him and to make him known, okay? Sometimes just read the book of Acts. But I wanted to say this, okay? And this is going to seem like a little bit of a diversion, but it's a necessary diversion, okay? As I was reading uh, the book of Acts, Luke, who is the author of Acts, I was reading every time that, that we talked about how to be full of the Spirit, and I felt like God directed me to the first time that Luke wrote down that phrase, full of the Spirit. Okay, if you know the Bible, you know that Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And I want to show you the first place where this phrase, to be filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to make sort of a cultural comment about something going on in our world right now. Okay, and then we're going to kind of start a little bit more of the teaching. Okay, so turn over to Luke chapter 1, if you would. I just want you to see this. It's so important. Luke chapter 1 and... We're going to look at verses 13 through 16, and then I'm going to show you one other place. Luke 1, verses 13 through 16. All right, this is a man named Zechariah and um, his wife Elizabeth, and they were without child, and then God appeared to him and said, you're going to have a child, and he's going to be special. His name will be John the Baptist. And watch what happened. First time that this phrase appears. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he, here's the first one, ready? And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. First time this phrase appeared is the God of the universe said, I'm calling out life in the womb and someone will be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first place they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit is a human being, baby, alive in the womb. Hold on to that. All right. Next phrase, just look down the page a little bit and you'll see verse 39 through 44. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, watch this, the baby leaped in her womb. Second time, ready? And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Okay, can I just take a a necessary little diversion here? Let me say this. Um, I don't even know how to say this, but I'm just going to say this, and however it comes out. We don't don't desire to be like a political church, if you will. Like, I'm never going to stand up here and say, here's Republican, here's Democrat, here's who you got to vote for, blah, blah, blah. I just think sometimes that gets so messed up. But I will say this. I will say this with an unequivocal boldness, all right? Sensitively but boldly. When there are areas in our culture, in our world, that represent the heart of God, like we got to stand as Christian leaders and say, this is the heart of God. This is, this is what God would want. And so some of you know this if you're familiar with the Bible, but God is passionate about life. He has made men and women in his image to reflect the very nature of God, meaning when you see a human being, it reflects God. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy the image of God, Okay. And I just want you to know that, like, when it comes to, to issue one, all right, I'm not going to talk long about it, but I would say that any issue out there that seeks to inhibit life in the womb or take away the rights of parents to, like, like shepherd and, and protect and, and be a part of children's 
decisions. Uh, let me tell you this, as a pastor, this isn't political, this is what I think God would say. I will quickly and boldly run to the polls and vote no on issue one, okay? And, please hear this, and, please also say this, and, as Christians, that's the easiest part, right? Like a vote, yeah, that, can we please be the kind of church that says, oh, there's a pregnant woman in our community? Okay, we'll open up our home and let her live with us and sacrificially love. Oh, we'll volunteer at that pregnancy child care center. Oh, we will give and love and serve and foster children and actually support other parents in our church that foster children. Let's not be Christians. It's just like, we made the vote. Woohoo! Let's wear a sticker. Let's be the kind of Christians that say, we want God's heart for this whole thing. All right? Okay. God, would you do that in our church? Would we be the kind of church like that? that we live out the fullness of your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter five, be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Last week, we unpacked almost every word. Um, and this week, I wanna talk about the how. And I wanna bring us first to this quote that, that's one of those quotes that kind of jumped off a page of a book to me because it gripped me because I was like, oh no, I've lived in that quote. I know people that have lived in that quote. I don't want to be a church that lives in that quote, okay? This is by V. Raymond Edmond, who uh, he was the president of Wheaton College, chancellor of Wheaton College. Um, in, listen to this. In his 90s, he was preaching at Wheaton Chapel, and he died on stage in the middle of a sermon. Oh, let me go like that. <laughs> Just take me home, Lord, like... Whenever the time is right. Uh, and he wrote a book called They Found the Secret. And in this book, I love this book, um, he said this quote about 20 lives that he studied, 20 great leaders that he studied. This is what he said. The pattern of their experiences is much the same. They had believed on the Savior, yet they were burdened and bewildered unfaithful and unfruitful, always yearning for a better way and never achieving by their efforts a better life. Then they came to a crisis of utter heart surrender to the Savior, a meeting with him in the innermost depths of their spirit, and they found the Holy Spirit to be an unfailing fountain of life and refreshment. Okay. He was writing this about Dwight L. Moody and Amy Carmichael and uh, William Booth and, and uh, Andrew Murray and all, the, all these 20 lives that were like, these people seem to be killing it for the Lord. Like they are striving, they're doing awesome, good moral lives, and yet they were gradually like discouraged and unfruitful. And they experienced the spirit-filled life. Okay? And so something in this says, all right, how? Like, not just like that's a pretty quote, but like, how? How do you live that? Okay, and so here's what I'm going to do today. I am going to point to six principles in God's word for how to live the spirit-filled life. Okay, here was the command of last week. Be filled with the spirit. I'm going to give you six uh, principles. And if you're, if you're hoping today for like, uh, like here's your three-point easy alliterated step process to how to be spirit-filled, you will be disappointed because there's some mystery to this, okay? In fact, um, uh, Nicodemus was having this, this spiritual leader, Nicodemus was having this conversation with Jesus. And he was like, how do you be Born again, how do you relate to the Spirit of God? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, it's like the wind, which doesn't make it less mysterious, okay? Like the wind, it's like you have to understand, it's like the wind, okay? And if I were to say, here's how you sail a boat, this, 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 like, like there's a little bit of mystery because there's a few principles to position the sail and tie the ropes, get it ready, 
for the mysterious wind to blow and move the boat. And likewise, there are some biblical principles that we can do for how to position our heart so that the Holy Spirit can fill us and we can live this empowered life that he's called us to live. Does that make sense? Okay. And here we go. I'm going to give you six principles. Uh, Back to Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit. Here's the how, okay? And here's the starting point. Um, A.W. Tozier, this great pastor from Chicago, says, here's the starting point. It begins with a question. And here's the question. Are you sure you want to be filled with the Spirit? It starts with desire. It starts with desire, okay? Are you sure you want to be filled with the Spirit? Because here's the phrase that I'd point to. The Holy Spirit tends to work where he is wanted, okay? Um, I did, uh, while, uh, probably about a decade ago, I did this five-year deep dive academic study on revival. I was longing for, to, uh, our ongoing longing for the revival of the YMCA, like studying the principles of how God revives organizations that have fallen asleep. And so I studied like the Welsh revival and the Hebrides Islands off of Scotland revival and the Azusa Street revival and the 1850s revival, all these revivals. You ready? This one pastor summed it up when he said this. Here's a starting point. The Holy Spirit tends to come where he is wanted. The Holy Spirit tends to move and work and transform where people have a desire for him to transform. And so here's the first question. Okay, ready? This is a vulnerable real question that every person in this room has to kind of wrestle with. Billy Graham said, to be filled with the Spirit means to be, ready? Controlled and guided by the power and presence of God. Let me say that again. Controlled, and later he says, guided by the power and the presence of God. And I say that word controlled, which he said intentionally, because as I think Western Americans, sometimes we hear that, we're like, pause on that word. Hang on a second. I don't want to be controlled. I'm in control of my life. Guided Like, I'd like to lead my own life. Thank you very much. Um, And if I were to say this, a really good analogy to to understand being filled with the Spirit is to say, this person is full of himself. Okay, what do I mean when I say that? This person's full of himself. Here's what I mean by that, okay? This person over here, this person, like, he, he's listening to his own desires, his own impulses, consciously or subconsciously. He's like, what do I want? Because that's what I'm going to do. What are my goals? That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm like, these are the ways that I work. That's how I'll work. He's full of himself, okay? But to be full of the Spirit is to, to have this heart posture where we immediately say, okay, Holy Spirit, I don't want to listen so much to my own desires, my own goals, my own agenda, my own like hopes for this day. I want to start out and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want? Because I want you to control and guide my day. Holy Spirit, what are your goals for for this hour? What, What do you want? You guide me. You lead me. Okay? Said this in the first service, but some of you, um, some of you are like, hey, I'm kind of stubborn and set in my ways. And can I just tell you something? I love you. Ready? Stubbornness is not a fruit of the Spirit. Okay? It's not. All right? It's not. (laughs) To be filled with the Spirit starts with this hard attitude of, okay, Lord, I'm willing to set aside my ways. Holy Spirit of God, I am giving you the car keys. You lead, you guide, you empower, you control, even though you might not like that word, control. You empower me to live the kind of life that you want to live, and you let your fruit be manifested through me. Okay? To be filled with the Spirit. So that's that's the first thing. It starts with a desire. The Holy Spirit fills a life that wants him to fill it. Okay. Here's the second. Repent. 
The Holy Spirit fills a life that desires to be clean before him. Okay, let me say that again. The Holy Spirit desires to fill a life that desires to be clean before him. If you were to look back one page in Ephesians, one chapter, you come to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Um, Ephesians 4, 30, watch this. We taught this, but let me just go back to what we've already taught. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay? We talked about this already, but when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you were indwelt with the Spirit of God. You were sealed by the Spirit. The, the Spirit of God came to make a residence within you. Okay? And there's all these things that we learn about the Holy Spirit. Like we haven't been left as orphans. We, haven't, we have him in us to lead us and guide us and convict us and illuminate God's word to us and display the fruit of Jesus through us and all these things. And he has personality. He can rejoice with how we're living and how we're obeying or he can be grieved. Meaning when we sin, which we all do, when we choose our control instead of God's control, we grieve the spirit of God. And here's what also happens. It inhibits his work. It blocks his filling, empowering, controlling. It's like, he's like, all right, you can have the keys. Like, I'm not going to control you. You can have the keys to your life and you can do it your own way. All right? And when we sin, it grieves the spirit of God. Okay, so... I, let me just illustrate it like this. I feel like a couple months ago, the Lord gave me a very tangible illustration. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, I was going through all these weird heart issues, which I didn't tell you all because here's the, here's the end news. Ready? I'm great. My heart looks awesome. Woohoo. But for a while, my, I was having like these strange like like my heart was hurting and I was having all these like numbness and stiffness in my neck and all these bad things. So I go into my doctor, Dr. Linker. I'm like, I think I'm good, but this is what's going on. And he's like, I think you're good, but let's EKG you and let's all that. And then he was like, okay, seems good, but that's like, you know, you've said bomb in an airport. We've got to like do all the heart tests. So, so they sent me to like stress tests and EKGs and um, all these, I don't know, run on the treadmill and all this stuff. And then I had to get an ultrasound, and I found out that, that uh, in our church, Chaz Updike, if you didn't know this, Chaz is a cardiovascular ultrasound ninja-like dude. Like, he's, he looks at your heart. And so, so I'm like, well, if I'm going to have to do this anyways, give me Chaz. So I went into Chaz, and I'm like, oh, hey, Chaz, what are you looking for? And he said this. He said, I'm going to look at your heart and the arteries that go in your heart, and I'm looking for plaque. And I'm like, I think I floss. I mean, what, what do you mean? Like, plaque? What do you, no, no, the plaque. You can have heart plaque, which is this, this black, hardened, like, substance that can go on the walls of your artery and build up over time. You might not even know that it's there. There can be obstructions. There can be buildups, and it blocks the flow of life-giving blood to your heart. Okay? And he ultrasounded me up, and he was like, I think your heart looks great. I don't see any plaque. Praise the Lord. Um, likewise, when we sin, when we take control, when we choose our own way instead of God's way, when we have attitudes or actions, when we... Uh, when we're living in anxiety or bitterness or unforgiveness or we say something or we respond or we choose lust instead of sexual purity or we choose like pride instead of humility or we choose a critical spirit instead of like a loving tender heart or we choose to resist the Lord or any other things, okay? This Sin builds up and blocks and obstructs the presence, the fullness of the Spirit living his life in us and through us. Okay? And every single one of us can fall into this every day and every hour. But can I give you just this beautiful verse? This is uh, 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, if we confess, this word confess literally means to agree with God. It means the Holy Spirit 
convicts us and we say, I agree. I am wrong. I, I have sinned before you, Lord. And then a second word, which is so important, um, it's the word repent. To repent means not only to confess, confession is tethered to it, not only to confess, but to turn from our sin and to run to God. Okay? Repentance means literally, literally the word repent means to renounce, or it means to do a turn where we turn from our sin and we say, I want your heart, I want your will, God. All right? And though when you're a follower of Jesus, you are saved for all of eternity, your daily intimacy and your daily spirit-filled life can be hindered. And that's why this verse says, hey, the call to be a follower of Jesus is a call to constant confession, repentance, saying, I repent before you. Would you cleanse me and transform me? And Jesus says, yes. All right? So part of the daily listening, living the spirit-filled life, can I tell you what I need to do every day and what you need to do every day? You listen to the Lord and you say, Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life that's not pleasing to you? Is there any attitude or action or response or apathetic lack of response? It's not pleasing to you. I confess and I repent. Here's the second principle. Ready? The Holy Spirit fills a life that desires to be clean before him. Okay? Holy Spirit fills a life that wants him. Holy Spirit fills a life that desires to be clean before him. Okay? Daily confession and repentance. It points you to a third principle. Surrender. The Holy Spirit fills a life that is surrendered to him. Or you could say it like this. Spirit of God loves to fill empty vessels. Okay? If your life is is a vessel, Holy Spirit loves to fill an empty vessel. Can I bring you to James? If you have a Bible, turn to James chapter 4. This is one of those in-your-face, punchy kind of texts. Okay? James is like calling out these people. And he actually, in context, he goes, you adulterous people, like you're living in this world. You got like one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom, and you're just like trying to like make everybody happy. Like you can't do that, okay? It's like you're two-timing God, all right? And then he says this. He says something that might sound strange to you. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God, it might be strange for some of you, ready, about the character of God. He's yearning jealously over the spirit that he's put in you. We tend to think of the word jealously, jealous like, I don't know, some trite, surfacy, kind of like teenage emotion or something. But no, actually, there's a righteous jealousy. Like God is like, I love you, and I want to indwell you, and I've put my spirit in you, and I want all of you. Don't you say that again? I love you. I've rescued you. I put my spirit in you, and I want all of you. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us. And this is a little bit of a, a different teaching that we've already walked through. But, but you remember that there's two Greek words for dwell? You remember this in Ephesians 3? You may want to shout them out. Two Greek words. Come on, come on. It's paraoikos and kataoikos. We talked about this. Paraoikos means to rent a room. Kataoikos means to own the home. If you rent a room, you're there, but it's like you can't change anything. You don't have access to everything. It's just like you're, this is like your little spot. Kata oikos, own the home. It's yours. Everything, it's yours. You you shape it, make it, break down walls, paint it, do whatever you want to do because it's yours. Okay? And so let me just ask you this. Please look at me, and this this is a vulnerable, tough question, but it's one we all have to ask. It's possible to be a follower of Jesus and to be like, 
I love you, Lord, in my God compartment on Sunday morning, in my community group on Wednesday night, and in these areas of my life. But when it comes to my finances, I'm, I'm going to do it my own way. Or when it comes to my dating relationship, like, like this is how I think it would be best, not according to your word. I'm just going to do it like this. Or, or when it comes to your thought life, like, like, or your internet usage life, okay? And God, the process of walking with God is actually this lifelong process of walking, not with like doctrine of God, but a living, breathing spirit of the living God within you who's often saying, can I have that? Can I have that? Can I have that? Can, would you surrender your finances to me? Okay, watch what I can do. Would you surrender your marriage and parenting to me to hear my voice and see how you want me to respond? Okay, watch what I can do. Would you surrender your friendships to me? Would you surrender every area of your life with me? God fills an empty vessel. He wants all of you, okay? He wants all of you. And in this book, they found the secret, kind of that crisis of surrender was when each of the 20 lives came to the end of themselves and basically said, all right, God, you can have my life. I can't do it in my own power and strength. He tends to fill an empty vessel, okay? Desire, repentance, surrender. Let me give you a fourth principle, okay? To ask him. The Holy Spirit fills a life that asks him. I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 11. Now, by the way, as I say this, um, uh, I've read so many books on the spirit-filled life and a lot of the biblical scholars, and people kind of people debate on this one. I don't even know. Uh, well, I'll tell you this. Some people say, say, we should ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. That should be a part of our daily, regular pleading before the Lord in prayer. Some people say, hey, actually, um, he's commanded this. He's already said he wants to do this. You don't have to to go through asking him. And I, I kind of think both sides have validity. But I'll tell you what, this is a really good uh, part of my heart posture before the Lord and approach before the Lord. And so I'd point you to Luke 11 and I'd say, why not? It can only, you know, help you. It helps me. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay. It's like, I am your father. I give good gifts. The greatest gift of all is the empowering presence of my spirit in you and through you. And I want you to ask me. Okay, so this is what I think the daily Christian life looks like a lot. Okay, if you want like simple daily Christian life? To wake up and to say, Lord, is there anything in my life, anything in my attitudes or actions that are not pleasing to you? Would you reveal it to me? And if something is brought up in your heart, like if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of something to say, okay, I confess, I repent. Thank you for your forgiveness. God, is there anything in your, my life that I'm holding on to, that I'm gripping on to, that's not fully surrendered to you? Okay, God, I surrender it to you. I want to be an open, empty vessel. And now, as I step into the classroom, when there's my 18 sixth graders looking up at me, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit, God? I don't have the power, strength, the resources to teach this class on my own. Would you fill me and teach through me? As you're sitting down, here's like my pastor world, sitting down for this counseling appointment. I don't know what to say. I don't feel like I have the wisdom. I don't feel like I have what it takes. Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Or Billy Graham definition, control, guide it so that your power and your presence is through me and it's not on my own strength. You're about to do your day at work. You're exhausted. You're annoyed with your boss. You don't like your fellow employees that much. Like, I don't have the fruit and the capacity to do this on my own strength. Okay, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? I want to walk with you. I want to be empowered by you to live this Jesus life of knowing you and making you known. Would you fill me? Okay.
I would just encourage you every day, ask him to fill you with his spirit, okay? Two more, and these, uh, these will be brief, okay? To desire, to repent, to surrender, to ask. Um, the fourth one, to engage in spirit-filled actions. Go back to the text, this Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. We, we totally unpacked this last week, but I don't want to miss it again to bring it up this week. Okay, that Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. And that is, to get all grammar on us, that is the dominant verb followed by all these participles, which are dependent verbs that are tethered to the dominant verb, meaning in real human talk, play basketball, dribbling, defending, screening, dunking. Okay, dominant verb, play basketball. All these are verbs that are part of playing basketball, right? They're the result or the, they're like part of basketball, okay? Paul's like, be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord. Meaning, there's a worshipful part of being filled with the Spirit, okay? Like, like as we worship, that's part of what God does that stirs up. His spirit filling and working in our lives. Of course the enemy wants you to be out of church, okay? Where else in the world do you get around with a whole bunch of followers of Jesus and start singing, start like addressing one another and sings and song, wait, and singing and making melody to the Lord. I'm sorry, I can't even speak. God wants you to worship. I knew, I had a friend one time about 20 years ago and he's like, He's like, I just study, and, and he would sit down during worship all the time at these conferences. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't worship. I'm like, no, 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 God, like, like, it's part of stirring you up. It's like, God's got a purpose for this. Are you feeling a little spiritually dry? Are you feeling a little spiritually distant? Turn on some worship music. Get with the followers of Jesus and start singing of the greatness of God and watch how he might just, like, refresh you with his spirit because that's what he does. You engage, you don't disengage, all right? Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. Gratitude is a part of this. And last week I talked about this, but the recent groundbreaking studies in neuroscience tell us that neuropathways can't be filled both with discouragement and stress and gratitude at the same time. So secular scientists are saying, are you struggling with stress? Choose gratitude. Start listing out in a journal things you're grateful for. I'm like, what? We've been saying that as the people of God forever. Like, like... If we are grateful, if we're grateful, when we choose gratitude to focus our mind and hearts on the things that we're grateful for, God uses that to stir us back up. Are you feeling spiritually dry, distant, like living in your own effort? If you will start saying, okay, God, I'm so grateful for this. I'm choosing to be grateful about this. I'm choosing to surround myself in worship and gratitude. God uses the means of the spirit-filled life to stir up the spirit-filled life. And finally, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When we serve, when we honor, when we put others first, when we lift others up. There's just something amazing about serving others that God uses to stir up the spirit-filled life. So I would say this, fifth thing, ready? Now, desires, repentance, surrender, ask, and engage. Don't disengage in the things, the pathways that God has given us. And finally, Last thing, by faith, okay? To live and walk by faith. Everything in this Christian life is given to us by faith. Like, Jesus is like, yeah, he had faith to be healed. And like, when I saw your faith, you are saved by faith, by grace through faith, okay? And so let me just point you to this verse in John chapter 7. Um, this is Jesus um, on the day of this feast in Jerusalem. And a lot of people didn't like him. And a lot of people were like, where is he? Because we want to attack him. And Jesus, who never backed down to anybody, stands up <laughs> and says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up, cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Spirit has said, out of his heart will flow rivers 
of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, with whom, with those whom believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus is like, those who believe in me, I'm going to put my Spirit in them. And it will be like rivers of living water flowing out of them. But, but part of it is believing, even when we're not feeling it. Okay? To believe that he will do what he said he will do. Rivers of living water by faith. Um, Elizabeth, would you come up and play? I'm going to close with an illustration that has just been so meaningful to me. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to pray this over our, our church and ask you to join me in praying this. Um, uh, just one of my favorite stories of all time by a guy... I love and admire his name is Bill Bright, and he he would point to this story, and so I say this almost in honor of him. Uh, there was there was this poor sheep herder shepherd that lived in the Great Depression by the name of Ira Yates. Okay, and Ira and his family were not doing well. Uh, they were poor. They were living on government subsidy. Uh, they didn't have enough food. Didn't have enough clothes. Um, and again, they lived on this like desert ranch in Texas during the Great Depression. One day, this oil company showed up and said, we've been doing our geological studies. We, we think there might be oil on this land. Can we dig here, Ira? He was like, go right ahead. Um, and they drilled down that day. And on that day, 80,000 barrels of oil shot up in 1930. From that day till now, there has been an average of over 125,000 barrels a day. That day, back then, it was $2.5 million. Okay, so here's the point. Here's the point for him, but mostly for us. He had an immeasurable resource that was his. He owned it. He just didn't know how to tap into it. He didn't know how. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you have the spirit of the living God within you. You have him in you, okay? You have the fullness of God, all that he wants for you. But how do you position your heart or set the sail so that he can empower you to live the kind of life that he promises you. First of all, you got to want it. You got to be like, okay, I desire not to live my own power, own strength, own control, own effort. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, like I yield to you. I want you to empower me. Do you have that desire? Second, is there anything in your life like blocking, inhibiting like sin in your life? Because he wants to fill a life that is clean. You have to you have to repent, okay, daily. Listen to him and repent. Third, there's a surrender. Like any aspect of your life that you got your hands gripping onto, he wants open hands that are surrendered before him. And he fills an empty vessel forth. I think it's a good process just to ask him. Daily, hourly, Holy Spirit, will you fill me? to engage. Don't be passive about the things that he's given you. Don't try to live a spirit-filled life and say, I don't need the church and I'm not going to be grateful about anything and it's all going to be about me. See how that goes for you. It won't go well, okay? You engage in the pathways that he's given you and then we just receive this by faith. And so this is what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray I'm going to pray on behalf of me and behalf of our family, this church family here. And if you want to, if you want to just let your heart tune in to my prayer, um, it's just praying for a fresh empowerment to the Holy Spirit, which is what I want for me and for each of us. And so I would just say, let your heart pray with me and then we will sing to the Lord. So why don't you bow your head and close your eyes and let me pray. Oh, Father, um, I want and we want, all of you, we just want you to have your way. We want you to, 
to fill up these vessels where we live with your, your power and grace and fruit and life just in us. We, we want you, God. I feel like the verse sometimes, like, I believe, help me in my unbelief. God, where our desire is weak, would you stir it back up? Because we desire you, Lord. And I just acknowledge as a pastor of this church, I have sinned so much. My attitudes, my actions, um, they, they often hurt your heart. And I just pause and I'd ask you, oh family, church family, just pause. If there's anything in your heart and in life that the Spirit of God brings to mind, just lift it before the Lord right now. us, forgive us, make us clean. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes us clean. And God, I, I surrender every area of my life, my thought life, my marriage, my family, my finances, my everything, every area of my life, and just pause and ask him, like, is there any area of your life that you're taken your own control that you haven't invited him in and do that right now and now we ask you Holy Spirit would you just would you just fill us by your spirit and we believe that you will do what you've said that you will do we love you we love you it's in your beautiful name we pray and we're going to close just with a time of communion. Um, there is a means and a way which we can live this God life in us. It's because God died for us. He gave his life. He let his body be broken and his blood be shed. And we take communion to just remember that. To remember that, that the, like, the climactic hinge point that the whole world flipped upside down on was that Jesus came and died on a cross and then rose from a grave. He's like, don't forget that. You're going to forget lots of things. Don't forget that. Do this to remember him. And then it's a moment also where the scripture says, don't do it in an unworthy manner. Like, don't do it flippantly. Like, really engage with the Lord. For some of you, God might be highlighting something that he wants you just to really engage with him on today. So, um, Take some time repenting and being with the Lord. Then if you're a follower of Jesus, take communion. And then we're going to stand together. And we're going to call upon the same God from the beginning till the end. Um, who loves us and has done this for us. Take some time in communion and then we'll stand and worship.